We have information about our church. If you need something, you need to communicate to us. Use those connect cards in the chairs in front of you. And you can fill those out in like your email. You want to have a question about the church, a prayer need, whatever it is, fill out one of those cards. Put it in one of the black boxes here in the sanctuary. Back to you and we'll, we'll take care of whatever you need to communicate to us. A couple things going on we just want to pull your attention to. If you're a member here on next Sunday night at 7 o'clock right in this room, we're going to be having a meeting, a special membership meeting. Our, our membership needs to approve uh, extra budget expenditures over a certain amount. And so we need you to approve that. We are hiring a company to come in and help us. So we need you to approve that. I have absentee ballots out here. If you're a member, you can fill that out if you're not going to be here next week. But we need to have a quorum to make sure we can move forward with that. All right, so if you have any questions, you can talk to me. I'll be in the hallway after the service. Also, if you're a grandparent or you're going to be a grandparent and you want to have influence on your grandkids, we're taking, we're having a seminar, a grandparent seminar here, a national one. It's going to be a Friday night and a Saturday. It's a great opportunity to learn how to influence um, your grandkids for the Lord. And so if you're interested in that, the reason we're advertising now, it's in the fall, it's in October, but the reason we're advertising now is there's a special reduced rate uh, to the end of this month if you register now for the October date. So that's going to be uh, done here at the end of this information again outside in the hallway. Men's breakfast, if you're a man here, I uh, will encourage you to come out to it. We'll have a speaker, we'll have breakfast. It's going to be a great time. We haven't had these since before COVID. So we're looking forward to this Saturday, July 30th. Uh, please come out to that, guys, 8 a.m. here at the church. Also, our, our Impact Sports is starting up. Impact Sports uh, starts up in August. They have uh, coaches are going to be getting information. We, uh, we have about 100 uh, kids already signed up for flag football. We're hoping uh, to get enough coaches to man all that. So if you coached last year, you're going to coach again. We need to know about that uh, so we can get you information. Uh, to get a hold of any of the staff, you just use their first name at cornerstonechurch.life, not .com, but .life. And so the person who's in charge of that, her name is Melissa. It's Vin's assistant. She's going to be helping him out. Melissa at cornerstonechurch.life if you want to help coach. Registration's open. Again, we're over 100 kids already, but be, uh, we need coaches. So if you're willing to help out coach football, men or women, we're, we're, we'll really appreciate that. They're going to give you all the stuff you need to coach, all right? And lastly, we are partnering uh, this fall. There it is. We're partnering this fall with uh, Lighthouse Ministries up in Niagara Falls. We do a lot of stuff up in Niagara Falls to help folks. We're doing a backpack ministry for them. Uh, uh, Joanne Lorenzo and uh, Magdalene Ministries and also Lighthouse Ministries, they, they help kids in inner city Niagara Falls get backpacks together for school in September. And right now there's a lot of sales on school supplies. So we're trying to get that together. So there's a, a backpack. There's a list out here. There's some boxes. We're going to be having our, uh, our um, Summer Jam VBS program. They're going to be filling them, but we really need people to buy back really nice backpacks so we can help 100 kids. Our goal is to get 100 backpacks to inner city kids so they have school supplies uh, this uh, fall. So if you're interested in that, please go out. There's, there's information out there. You can see all the different things you can get, and there's, you can get a flyer about that. All right, uh, the deaconesses are heading that up, and if you have any questions, you can um, email me, and I can forward you over to Esta, my wife. She's the one kind of heading this up. All right? I think that's it. Let me pray for us. You are such a good God, Lord. You are so good. And we want to we stimulate our community to search for you, to find you, because you're a good God. And we love you, and we want to serve you, and we want to do your will. And Lord, this morning as we worship, we want to honor your beautiful name. We want to bring glory to you. That's why we're here. We're not here for us we're here primarily for you, Lord God, and to encourage each other. And Lord, we pray that our, our praise, our singing, as we listen to your word, you would fill our speaker, Lord God, fill Matt with your power. We pray that you would, you would work, Lord God. And we pray that we'd have an impact in our community. We pray for these kids that we're going to be hopefully supplying with backpacks, Lord God, that you would bless them and, and help them, Lord God, as they're struggling, Lord. I pray for uh, a Naira Gospel Mission, that you would have impact there, Lord God. I pray that you would use that mightily. We pray for New Story Church and Kenmore Alliance Church, and we think of Grace Church, Lord God. We ask that you would work in these churches, Lord God, all around us that love you and serve you, that we would uh, be the light in a darkened world, Lord God. Lord, accept our worship and our praise. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Would you be, would you stand as we begin in worship?
out of despair and out of my sin into the hope of your resurrection Jesus I come to you out of my storm and into your calm out of distress and into your joy and song Jesus I come to you
it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations.
Lord, we come before you, ready to hear from you, expectantly waiting your voice and your presence, God. Thank you for this time we have to gather together and worship you to pour out our lives as a sweet incense to you. I pray that every day of our lives, that is our motivation, that is our desire to please you, to glorify you, God. Speak to us this morning in your name, amen. If we haven't met, uh, my name is Matt. I serve on staff here as one of the pastors. And if you can't tell, I'm a uh, product of Generation X. Any other Gen Xers out there? Yeah, all right. A phrase came out because of our generation, I like to say, which the, the boomers and the, and the builders probably don't like. Or maybe you don't even know about it. Keep it real. Anybody heard the word phrase, keep it real, before? No. Wow, all right. I'm going to keep it real with you. So keep it real means speak truth. You know, you may not want to hear this, but you need to hear this. I'm going to be true and authentic to myself and what needs to be said, and I'm going to say it. I think we need that in our lives. We need people who are going to keep it real with us, who are just going to tell us the way it is. And actually, I think the people who've helped mold and shape me are the ones who kept it real with me, the ones who spoke truth, maybe when I didn't want to hear it, but I needed it whether it's rebuking me about things that I was doing or things that I was thinking or believing or looking at, they kept it real with me and they told truth. We all need that. A little course correction. And that's what's going on here in the book of Hebrews. We're coming upon a section where it gets, gets kind of real. If you don't know, we're in the book of Hebrews and it, you know, when you hear us mention the writer, we really don't know exactly, definitively, who wrote his different opinions. Um, so we're just going to say the writer Hebrews. So the writer Hebrews is, is ta- now talking to people, and he's keeping it real with them because they need to hear these truths. So if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. If you don't have a Bible, uh, don't worry, the words will be on the screen above me. But also we have them in the seat pockets in front of you, a little trays underneath the chair. Um, if you want to, take that with you, please. It's our gift to you. Thanks for being here today. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, take it with you because we have lots of those Bibles um, to, to replace. And actually, a Bible does nobody any good sitting on a shelf. So please, take it with you if you, have, if you don't have one at home. But like I said, we're going to be in chapter 10. Hebrews is about maybe three quarters, a little more through the Bible. We're going to be in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. The writer says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Please pause with me as we pray. God, this is your message to us today. Help us apply it to us. Help us understand it in a way that's true to how you want us to know it, but also make it true in our lives so people can see it and we walk in it. Let anything and everything I say not be about me, be about you and point people to your son, Jesus Christ. Empty us out, Lord, starting with me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, amen. All right, cool. I'm actually going to start at the end, in verse 25. He talks about, the writer says, as you you see the day drawing near. Other translations will actually insert the words, day of the Lord drawing near. What does that mean? It means the day that you'll see Jesus. Now there's different opinions about what that means. We don't know when, we don't know how. There's there's a lot of experts out there who've had their their opinions and just about all of them have been wrong so far, which is, you know, people who just hold it loosely say, well, I told you you're wrong. But whether he returns 
or we die before that day, we will all be face to face with Jesus one day. Every person, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, will stand before the Lord. And here's the tough part. Not everybody who will face him knows him or follows him. So regardless if they're a believer or not, everyone will stand before God. Everyone will be face to face with Jesus. He'll stand before them and he says in his gospels how he'll have the goats and the sheep. So we'll all be face to face with him. Which one are you going to be, a goat or a sheep? Sheep is the good one, just to let you know. So we're going to see him. So until that day happens, because we're in anticipation of that. The, the Christian life is, is what I like to say, it's an already but not yet. It's already, you already have these things. These things are already true. You are saved, you are redeemed, you are forgiven, but you don't have the full extent of it yet. So until that day comes, until you see Jesus face to face, there's a couple of things we want to, this, this, this text kind of shows to so until we see Jesus, let's talk about what we have. What do we have? He's given us a lot. All right, what's the already? What do we have? Well, we have attitude. Um, if you have children, like I have, I have three, you may use that word in a negative way. Oh, she's got some attitude on her. I'm talking about my, my daughter. All of my son's getting it too. But attitude, in essence, is really just the way we approach things or respond things, the way we view things. It's a vantage point. Uh, talking with a pilot a few years ago, attitude is pretty much like the nose of the plane, the way it's going up or down, how it approaches what's coming ahead of it. That's our attitude. So we, we should have an attitude. What kind of attitude should we have? On a confidence. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence... Confidence. Why should we have confidence? Well, I think as believers, we need to have a humility, so confidence kind of goes in the opposite of that sometimes. Like we, over here, we said we have a holy humility, one of our values about loving God, knowing who we are with and without God. And, but God gave us confidence. He did not give us the spirit of timidity, but one of boldness. Now, I have... Please don't get offended. A very low view of mankind. All right? you, you watch people in general, you're going to be pretty discouraged. I remember back, you know, there was a movie in the 90s. A, a, a guy was able to listen to, to women's thoughts and know what people were thinking. Right? And then Facebook came around. And we got to figure out what people were thinking. And we we're like appalled. Like, oh my gosh, I can't. People are thinking that. Because at, at, at the end of the day, we're all just wretched sinners who need a savior. We're all imperfect, flawed beings whose default mode is to sin. So how can I have confidence then before a holy and perfect God? It's right there in the word, therefore. Whenever, if you're reading the Bible, maybe if you're fairly new to it, there's, there's a little kind of a hokey thing we say is, whenever you read the word therefore, look back to find out what it's there for. So you just go back a couple of verses. And starting in verse 16, the writer says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After these, those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin." Do you get that? How can we be confident before God? It's not because of anything I can do, but it's something that I am. I'm forgiven. I've come to the point to realize that I have a sin problem. There's nothing I can do it on my own. And the only way to make that right is to confess that sin. Confess means to say again, because God already knows. Confess that to my God and ask for forgiveness. And that's how I can have confidence. That's why I can have the attitude of confidence until I see Jesus. I told my kids I want them to have a confident humility. Yes, we're supposed to be meek and humble, but you know what? God calls us to be confident in this world. 
do I have confidence? It's not so much confidence in yourself, it's confidence in your God. Do you have that? We also have access. So we have attitude and we have an access. It says to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. To enter the holy places by the, the blood of Jesus. Now, now, the holy places, and we'll get this in a couple of minutes, but the holy places were like the presence of God. By how? By the blood of Jesus. The blood that he spilled on the cross. By the new and living way. The word new there, it's actually the only time it's used in, in, in the New Testament that form of the word new. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. But really what it means is new, it's two different words, newly slain or freshly killed. That's the word there. That's because of his blood, the new and living way that only he can do it, that was impossible before to be in the accent, be, have access to a holy God. That he opened us through his curtain. Now the curtain is what separated the Holy of Holies, which was the presence of God, from just the holy place where only the priest can go. So not only if you were a Jew and you wanted to go to the temple, there's certain areas you couldn't go and there's definitely places nobody can go except one person one day a year and that's the high priest. But Jesus opened that through his blood, through his flesh, through his way. That is through his flesh. He did it. He gives us access. So do I enter the holy places? What does that mean? Do I enter the holy places? This is the illustration I was talking about a minute ago. This is the, the tabernacle that would later on become like the temple. There's that curtain right there. That's the Ark of the Covenant, which is the presence of God. The high priest, one day a year, only he can go in there. Now anybody can go in there because that veil was torn. When Jesus was on the cross, the last word he said was to die. It is finished. After he said that and breathed his last breath, the, the earth roared and shook and the curtain which separated the presence of God from everything else was torn in two from top to bottom. Which means you and I, we have access to the presence of the living God all through the blood of Jesus. When was the last time you stood before the throne of God? I mean, now we may think, well, God's omnipresent. You're right. And there's times where, you know, I'll admit this, I'm, I'm praying and it could almost seem rote, routine. Yeah, I'm going to pray for my wife, pray for my kids, pray for the church. But then I'll, I'll, I'll remember that when I'm on my knees praying, I'm kneeling before the throne of God because he's right there before me. And I, as his child, have access. And he doesn't need to listen to anyone's prayers, but he listens to mine. I have access. So until Jesus, until I see our Lord and Savior face to face, I have access to God, to the holy places because I'm a son of God. So we have attitude, we have access. We also have an advocate. An advocate who's basically someone who speaks up for, takes the cause for another. They'll vouch for them. Sometimes even when we say like co-sign a loan. You say, I know you don't know this person, but I do, and I'm gonna represent them. Jesus is our advocate. On behalf of us, he speaks to God. Because of him, we have access to God. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. As mentioned earlier, the high priest is the only person who was allowed to enter the presence of God one day a year. And throughout Hebrews, we see over and over again that Jesus is presented as the great high priest, the best. No, we don't need another to come after him. He intercedes for you. The high priest would intercede for the people under his care. Did you know that Jesus is praying for you right now? 
I don't care what you're going through. He's praying for you. Not only that, there are saints around the world who are praying for you. Do you personalize that, though? Is Jesus my high priest? We, we have this, this earthly vision of, of what a priest is. And maybe you grew up in a tradition where you had priests and you had, you know, you had to confess sins in a, in a box to them and they would absolve sins. But, man, that's not it. We got a greater high priest and his name is Jesus. But is he your high priest? So we have this. All these things that we have until we see Jesus. We have them. They're yours. If you're a child of God, they're yours. Whether or not you use them, utilize them, or realize them, they're there. But also we got to talk about what we do. What are we going to do with these things that God's given us? Because until you see Jesus, he's kind of given us some things that we should be doing. This is not what we call like a works-based righteousness where you do these things and then you become saved. It's no, I become saved, I receive the grace of God, and therefore I do these things. So what do we do? We want to approach. Let us draw near. Draw near. Like, I like that. It's like being pulled in with a true heart. Which means you're not trying to lie to yourself. We, we, do, we, we do that so often. We think, well, I'm not as bad as, as that guy. We try to justify our behaviors like we're in the right somehow. Instead of being open and honest with ourselves and with our God. But there's a balance there, which is awesome. A true heart, which means, you know what? My heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can trust it? With a full assurance and faith. Which means even though I'm this way, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, and I'm assured of that. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. As I mentioned earlier, I have a low view of humanity in general. Because you know, um, Pastor John and I say, I, I came to faith later, I was almost 30 when I got saved, and I still know what hell smells like. I still know what it's like to be on that path to hell with no one telling me the right way to go. Yesterday, uh, one of my buddies who I used to hang out with, he got married. And as a pastor, and pretty much the only pastor, a lot of my former, what I say, BC friends before Christ, I'm the only person they know who, who's a pastor, I do some weddings. And I was reminded yesterday, and, and, and he's a good dude, but the atmosphere, the environment was not God-centered at all. It was, it was an evil conscience. And it broke my heart, but it made me so appreciative of the grace that I received because I knew where I was headed. My heart was sprinkled clean. And our bodies washed with pure water. Now, this is actually a visualization of baptism. And baptism is actually an illustration of our faith in Christ. So when we're washed by the water, when somebody is baptized, and we have a baptistry back here, or we've done it in horse troughs outside, if you want to do that, we've got an outdoor service, we can do that in two weeks. But what happens is we ask somebody, confession of faith, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? They say yes, and then we lower them in the water. And many times pastors will say, Lord, in the likeness of his death, raised in the newness of life. The old me is lowered and dead. The new me is alive. That's what we get. That's why we approach him. Because I have a new life in Christ. Positionally, I'm a child of God. Like, like it's a really cool thought. Like, I, I have an earthly mother, an earthly father, yeah. But I am a child of God. Positionally, when I came to faith in Jesus, I was adopted. I became a co-heir. I'm holy, I'm righteous, redeemed, I'm forgiven. I can go on and on and on about my identity in Jesus. That is never going to change. Nobody can take it away, not even me. But 
even though positionally I'm there, there's times where my intimacy is going to be off. There's times where my flesh is going to tell me, hey, you don't need to do that. It's okay. Well, you know what? You're forgiven. So just add that to the tab that God has for you. Is that really showing me intimacy with God? Do I love him that much where I'm going to break his heart even more? No. But my flesh is going to fail. There's going to be seasons where I'm not going to be as close to him as I want to be or should be. And I meet with people, and I, you know, a lot of times when things are going wrong, it's when they call a pastor and they want to meet up. And it's usually not. I rarely have gotten the phone call of, hey, pastor, things are going great. Let's meet. It's like, I need to talk about a few things. And when, well, I'll sit with them and I'll listen and I'll ask them, well, tell me, what, how's your intimacy with God right now? And one of two, two answers would be, not good or not good as it should be. And my response to the latter is, duh. Nobody's intimacy with God is as good as it should be because we're finite, flawed, fallen creatures. But how close are you with God? How close are you? Positionally, you might be there. You might already be saved, forgiven. But maybe you're not walking in a way that keeps you close with him. How are you doing with that? How close are you approaching him? Is he drawing you near or are you resisting him? So we need to approach God, but we also we need to cling. Until we see Jesus, we need to cling to him. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And I love that phrase, hold fast, because if you're holding, you're not really going fast. You know, it's, it's kind of an oxymoron there, but you're holding so tight so you don't go anywhere, you don't lose your grip. What are we holding on to? Our hope. Holding on to our hope. Because he who promised is faithful. Nothing that I've done is faithful. He is faithful. I hold on to him and my faith in him, my hope in him, because sometimes he's all that I got. You know, when you don't have much to cling, you cling to what you got. And I know a lot of people who've hit rock bottom and all they've had is Jesus. And that's more than enough. He'll pull you out of that. He's got amazing things ahead of you, for you. Hold fast to him. It gets better, trust me. There was a story that came out a few weeks ago. So I want to first, how fast, how do I hold fast to my hope? Am I clinging to him? Am I clinging to God when he's all that I have? Or do I have so much that I think I don't need to? He's my case of emergency break glass option. Or am I holding fast to him? So that's a little soccer ball that a guy found. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was a couple kids playing at the beach with their family. And if you brought kids to a beach or you've been a kid at the beach, odds are you probably lost something. These kids are playing in the water, and I'm sure their mom told them, come back, come back, you'll lose it, you'll lose it. Well, guess what? They lost it. It went out to sea. That little ball. About two weeks later, a gentleman on the, on the right, he was out with his buddy. His name's Ivan. And they got swept away at sea. The current pulled him away. Now, Ivan and his friend Martin, they're stranded. Martin actually drowned. But when Ivan was out there, barely keeping afloat, he sees this little ball travel from 80 miles away, go across him. And he held on to that ball. And it kept him afloat. Held on, getting battered by the waves in the ocean and the current. He held on for 18 hours until he was rescued. So when I think of holding fast, I think of him. Holding on to something that probably you think wouldn't save him, 
wouldn't make sense, but it kept them through. That's our hope in Jesus. The world may not make sense of it, of how we can get through, how we can hold on, but we need to cling on to him when we have nothing else. When those around us are fading and failing, we hold on to Christ. Because he's all I got. You do that and he'll bring you home. We also need to stimulate. To be honest, I was kind of tough to find the right word for this last one. And the Baptist in me want to throw another A up there. But... Uh, because it's an interesting word, and we'll talk about that right now. So in 10, 24 to 25, let us consider, and don't forget this one, let us consider, which means we need to think and ponder about this. We need to weigh the different options. We need to consider, let us consider how to stir up one another. We have some uh, horse people here, so I, I hope you don't mind this illustration, but really that word stir up is it can be translated also as spur on. Well, what's a spur? Very sharp ob metal object in the back of a boot. Meant to, pro to, meant to provoke and hurt the horse to get it to move, to motivate it to move. We're called to do that with other believers. Talk about keeping it real. That's keeping it real with them sometimes. It's telling them the truth that they don't want to hear, but you know it's going to move them. It's going to motivate them. It's going to provoke them to, into action. Again, we don't want them just to hurt. That's not you know, the difference between, between discipline and punishment. Discipline means I, I'm going to help you learn the way to keep you in the right way. Punishment means I just want you to hurt. We want to help discipline people. We want to help, to, and, and so we want them to help not just be in pain, but to love. We want to stir them up to love, to be selfless. To, and good works, to love others and to serve them. It's not about you. You realize that? The Christian life, it's not about you. It's about Jesus and others. How do we do that? How do we get motivating people to do that? So we want to stir them up to love and good works and not neglecting to meet together as it's the habit of some. In the original language in Greek, the word meet together is actually the same root word for synagogue, which is a congregation, a group of believers. We got to keep meeting together. And I'm not just talking Sunday morning. How do you share life with other people who have this greatest thing in common with you? If you're a believer in Jesus, the greatest thing in your life, the greatest, thing, greatest common denominator with you as a believer is your faith in Christ. So why wouldn't I want to share that life with other believers? I want to share life. i got to meet with other people. Because you know why? You guys are my family. You, you, every person who calls Cornerstone Church home, you are my spiritual family. And our family is all over the world. There is a phrase used, the sun never sets on the, king, on the United Kingdom. Meaning that wherever there was daylight, there was, a, there was a, a, uh, an island, a colony of, of Britain. You know what? The sun never sets on God's kingdom. You have family in every continent. I love my family. I want to see them. I want to spend time with them. I want to hang out with them. Yeah, sometimes I got to speak truth to them and I need others speaking truth to me. But I got to meet with them. We had about, what, eight weeks, two years ago where we were online only. And I remember the first time we met outside, just seeing my brothers and sisters in the faith in their car made me emotional. We got to meet together. And why do we knew that? Why do we need to meet together to encourage one another? Because this world will beat you down. It will tell you you're not good enough, so don't even try. I need my faith family to walk it through with me. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the question here is, to stimulate, how do I help strengthen others? 
Remember, it's not about you. How are you helping somebody else in the faith? If you've been walking with Christ, if you've been a Christian, I would say more than a year, how have you blessed others with your time, talents, and treasures? How have you served? How have you poured into? How have you prayed with? Grown together with? That's strengthening others. I met with someone this past Wednesday who's fairly new to the faith. You know, it strengthens me because I get encouraged because he's like drinking through the fire hose right now. You know how uplifting it is seeing someone walk with Christ and realize the things that they have? That's an amazing thing to see. So how are you doing that? How are you helping strengthen others? The last few decades, church has kind of transitioned. And, I, and church, when original form, is actually a people. It's gone from a people to a building. And sometimes we consider church being the service. Have you been to church lately? That's not what it's supposed to be. And with that mentality, though, of being the service, many churches with good intentions have made it all about the performance on Sunday morning. Make it consumeristic where we want to entertain you, where it's all about you. Where I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to sing the songs you want to hear. I'm going to tell you the truths that you want to hear. So we've, we've made a people as believers in the 22nd, 21st century church where it's all about them. So two years ago, when we transitioned, hopefully short term, from in person to online, some people were all about it. It looked like this. Church is now in your living room. All right. And you know what? It could be a great supplement. What I mean a supplement is maybe in addition to what you're doing or short term. There's people who may be sick. There have been people who've been quarantined, people who've been injured or frail. This is a great supplement. But too many times, because we have this mentality of it's all about me, I get to not have to go anywhere or see anybody. I can just have church come to me. And that's not what it's about. Because there's people who need you. And you need other people. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of a community of called out people. And we can't do these things. We can't stir up others and love others to good works. And we can't meet together and encourage one another if we're only online with the other. It's got to be in person. A lot of Christians have, that, have this kind of mentality of what it means to be a Christian, very similar to this, this scenario. This represents parents leaving for a few days, giving instructions to the, their daughter, while we're gone, make sure you do this, this, and this, no parties, don't have people over, fill in the blank, whatever your, your parents might have said to you, or maybe what you say to your kids. And let's say we'll be back Sunday at 5 o'clock. So, parents leave, the daughter's probably watching them go down the driveway, and then she relaxes and does whatever she wants. Maybe she's doing the things they told her to do or not do. Maybe she's doing everything she was never able to do because her parents weren't there. But what do you think she's doing Sunday at 4 o'clock? Working like crazy to get the house in order. Knowing her parents will be home at five. Knowing that if they come home and they see a clean house, they think, oh, we've got a good daughter. But that's not how it is. We don't know the day, the time, the hour of when we'll be face to face with Jesus. Nobody does. When Jesus walked this earth, he said, even I don't know, only the Father in heaven knows it. We don't know when he's coming back. We don't know when we're going to be face to face with him. We need to act as if it's today. Will you be ready? Will, will you draw near? Are you going to cling to him? Here's one last question for you. It won't be on the screen, though. 
when you see him, what will you be caught doing? Trying to get things in order? We're so happy to see him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the message we get to share. Nothing that comes from me, but Lord, I pray that it penetrates the hearts and soul of everybody, starting with me. Help us, help me walk in this manner until I see you face to face. It's going to be a glorious day, Father. And too often we think about the side benefits of heaven, of no, of no more pain and no more suffering and seeing loved ones. But so many times we forget that you'll be there. And I don't want to be there if you're not there. So help us prepare for that. Prepare with our hearts, our mind, our souls, our bodies, everything we do. Help us be ready until we see you face to face. Help us wrestle with those questions of how do I know I'm forgiven? Where you say in your word, anyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, they will be saved. Let us never lose that opportunity. Oh Lord, we long to see you. We long to see you. And until we do, help us prepare. Help us keep it real with one another. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your heart in the word this morning. Would you stand as we close in song? I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of watch and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus made it all all to him I owe sin hath left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Oh
Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you have a wonderful and blessed week.